leading life groups, praying in those miracles. Life groups are happening, and we're starting a new season today, so check it out in the foyer. Wednesday at 11, special ladies groups here at church. That's going to be a lot of fun. Find out about that in the foyer. Wednesday night Bible study starts this week, 6 o'clock. So come on. Let's hang out. Let's grow together. Man, we have a lot of countries represented here at Christian Faith. There's only three of us that were actually born in America. I love it. God began to do great things in my life when my life stopped being small. I was raised in kind of a small mentality, kind of a uh, you know, small community. Uh, everybody looked alike and acted alike. I knew one person that wasn't white until I was 19 years old. And uh, it was just not negative, not like bad, but small. And so my vision was small. My plans were small. My future was small. I was just living a small life. And then it all changed when I met a man who became my spiritual father, took me to church. He actually took me to our Mill Creek campus back then. It was uh, with a different pastor. And my life got big. I met people that did not grow up where I grew up, did not look like I looked, did not think like I thought. And everything began to change at that moment. A few months later, I started Bible school, met Wendy, and again, I shifted to a bigger worldview. For the first two years that Wendy and I were together, we were dating but not married, Almost every month, we thought we might be called to a different nation. Because we were in Bible school and missions studies and studying ministries around the world, almost every month, I felt like God was calling me to a different place. And one month, I said to Wendy, I think God wants us to go to Brazil. And then the next month, I said, no, I think God wants us to go to Liberia. And then we would hear other teachers and other classes. And I said, I think God wants us to go to South Africa. And every month, Wendy would say, if you're called, I'm called. But our world was getting bigger. And I didn't know it at the time. But what was happening was God was telling me, stop thinking in your little box. Wherever we are from, Whatever is our background or nationality or family history, we can get stuck in our small world, in our thinking like everyone around us, not realizing there's much more, that God has created a large world and that we can be a part of it. And when you open up and begin to think beyond yourself, and your own little group, or even your own big group, then your life gets better. So today I want to talk to you about your worldview. How do you see your world? Not just the world, but your world. Do you think small and live small and stay small and, and my group matters and what I do is important and what my people need, that's the priority or are you thinking biblically? Are you thinking scripturally? Are you thinking from a godly perspective? Let's start in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. The apostle writes, If any man, which literally means if any person, man or woman, is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. So the goal that God has for us is, first of all, that we come to Christ, that we believe in the Messiah, 
the Savior, Jesus, the Christ. And when that happens, you become part of the family of God and you begin to live in a bigger world. You're no longer just an American or a Ukrainian or a Korean or a Mexican or an Australian or a South African. You're, you're part of the kingdom of God. Old things pass away. The old limitations, the old ways of thinking, the old ways of living, the limitations that the world may have put on you or that you may have put on yourself. They pass away, and all things become new. New horizons, new opportunities, new open doors. You know, some people say, if I could just get to a different country, if I could get to America, or if I could get to the UK, or if I could get to a better place, then I could live a better life. And yet often, they get there, and they get stuck in the same problems, sickness, poverty, strife, division. Their small world follows them wherever they go. I've met many people here in America that think if they move to a different place, that their life will be so much better. But the fact is, wherever they go, they take themselves. And when they get there, they create the same world. Birds of a feather flock together. And so they find small people with the negative or with the divisive or with the selfish mentality, and they end up in the same troubles, having the same struggles and the same issues. But the Bible's teaching us if we'll begin to think with a different world view, see our world, our world and the world from a godly perspective will begin to live on a new level. It's important how you see life because what you see is what you get. It's an amazing subconscious power that humans have. We move toward what we see. In the natural, it happens. If you're looking at something, you, you start moving toward it. If you're driving down the road and you're looking to the side, you start moving that way. It's just a natural phenomenon. But it's much more than natural. There's a, there's a subconscious thing. When you see a happy world, you move toward a happy world. When you see a sad world, you move toward a sad world. If you see a prosperous world, you move toward prosperity, abundance, success in that realm. If you see a poor world, you just create that. You move toward that. You, you embrace that because what you see is what you get. Your vision is your future. How you view your world is how you live in your world. So if you view people as bad and negative and prejudiced and against you and nobody loves me, I got to make my own, I got to stand on my own two feet. I had to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Nobody helped me. You got a small world and everybody you bump into has got a funky attitude because you got a funky attitude. You frown at the world and the world frowns back. But you begin to live large. You begin to live Loving, you believe, begin to live happy. You begin to believe that God is doing great things everywhere and that God is going to work through you to do great things. All of a sudden, you're finding opportunity and you're finding people who are happy and loving and kind. And yeah, you'll bump into the occasional problem. However, you rise above it. You overcome it. And good things follow you. So, what's your worldview? Are you struggling, trying to make a living, trying to get through, deal with all these bad people? Or are you living an abundant life because you know Jesus and old things have passed away and all things have become new? 
What's your worldview? It really is controlling how you live your life. Recently, I was watching one of our little ones at the daycare, and uh, everybody around this child loves this child. Mom, dad, the daycare workers, teachers, the other kids, everybody's just loving this child. And this child is so happy, he has no clue there's a problem in the world. Well, he's little right now, he doesn't need to have that. But I began to think about how he's going to grow up. He's going to grow up believing I can do all things. He's going to grow up believing life is my oyster and I'm just looking for the pearl. You know, he's just going to grow up believing whatever I put my hand to will prosper. And you know what? It will. That's what God said. Whatever you put your hand to will prosper. But what if you grow up fearful? scared. People don't like you. People are against you. Be careful. People are bad. You better watch out. That negative spirit begins to attract problems. It's kind of like the girl that always picks the wrong guy. You know that girl? I know it's not you, but you might know that girl. Always picks the jerk. Always picks the guy that lies and cheats and burns them. And they're like, why don't I pick the bad guy? Or the guy who always picks the wrong girl. You know, you're at church or you're at school or wherever. You're at the club. You find the craziest girl. Why do you do that? Everybody knows. Your brothers are like, dude, that girl's crazy. And you're like, yeah, but she got a great butt. (laughs) No, you're the butt. Why do people do that? Somehow in their worldview, they're directed to the negative. They're directed to the problem. They just go after the wrong things. And I suppose we've all done it at different times. But our goal is to find the God worldview and go after the God things and find the God life that he has planned for us. Jesus came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So if you've been living in that small or negative worldview, you gotta break out. You gotta set yourself free by following the Bible and begin to have a different view of your world and a different view of how you live your life. Years ago, we were still at the sanctuary in SeaTac. So this is over 20 years ago. We were singing the song, O Lord, I Ask for the Nations. It was a chorus that was popular at the time. And as we sang, I ask for the nations, I began to think about what God had done in our church and in my life. Remember now, I, I grew up in Tacoma, South Tacoma, Spanaway. And yet I became close with a man that had been raised in Washington, D.C. and experienced a whole different life than I had who became my spiritual father. And then I was ordained in Los Angeles with Pastor Fred Price, who at that time was the largest television ministry all over the world. Fred Price became an influence in my life. And then I connected with Dr. Cho, who at that time had the largest church in the world, a million members in Seoul, Korea. And I thought, Lord, how have... I connected with these people from all over the world. And then my friends in South Africa, Ray McCauley and Ott Boshoff and Brian Houston in Australia. And I'm just like, wow, Lord, we ask for the nations. By bringing these other people into my life, God enlarged my life. God got me out of a small worldview into a limitless worldview. And so I jumped up on the platform on that Sunday morning. You know, I hadn't made the plan. The praise team didn't know what I was doing. And 
Wendy didn't even know what I was doing. And I said, everybody that's been born outside of America, that's a part of our church family, would you come and stand? On that Sunday, I was shocked that we had over a hundred different nations and several hundred different people that had been born outside of America. Now, why would all those nations and all those people come to a church with some redhead kid from Tacoma <laughs> that got through a drug rehab center? How in the world did that happen? And I realized that God was teaching me and teaching us that if we could dream beyond our smallness, if we could think beyond our limits, if we could see beyond our normal, that he could do great things in our life. And so I'm asking you today, what are the limits? What are the small things or the, the natural things that you say about you or your world that keep you from the career, from the family, from the life, from the blessing, from the joy that God has for you? How will you move from old things pass away to all things become new? Well, part of it is going to be that you stop thinking small and thinking that your little people group is the most important. It's not. We all are the most important. Well, you don't know what my people have been through. All people have been through stuff. We can fight over who's had the worst. That ain't going to help nobody. It's like brothers and sisters fighting over who got, you know, the worst problem. Doesn't matter. We get stuck on the wrong things. And then we become prejudiced. And we become angry. We become critical and judgmental. And all that negativity just shrinks our world. What if we just say, Lord, I ask for the nations. I want to be a part of your world. Yes, I am from whatever country I'm from. Yes, I speak whatever language I speak. But my heart is bigger than that because I'm a child of God. I'm born of God. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm actually a new nation in him. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap right there. You know that from God's perspective, there are only two races. You know that, right? From God's view, from heaven's view, there's two races. Those who are in the kingdom, those who are not. I know in our world today, we're all about the political, the, uh, the, the politics of racism and nationalities and borders and immigrants. We're all about that in our world. But from God's view, it's two races. Those who believe, those who don't. Those who receive Christ, those who reject Christ. Those who are born of God, those who are not born of God. Those who are in the kingdom, those who don't believe in the kingdom. It's only two people groups from God's view. So you're one or the other. I hope you're in. It's always your choice. God will never take your choice. The Bible said he set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. Now the world wants to push you force you. If you don't choose what we say to choose, we will cancel you. We will hate you. We will fire you. We will condemn you. God says, well, here's your choice. You choose life or death, blessing or cursing, Jesus or not, kingdom or no. 
So it's always your choice. In the world, they're pushing you, forcing. If you don't do it the way we say to do it, you are bad. You are evil. You are canceled. But from God's perspective, your choice will always be your choice. So are you in or not? Do you believe or not? In Mark chapter 16, the Bible said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Now, the word creature is kind of a funny word. That's old English. It literally means every ethnic group. There is no ethnic group more important in God's eyes. They're all important. There's no ethnic group more special in God's eyes. They're all special. Uh, funny, Caleb was saying before about in heaven, we, we're not going to be talking English. Some of you got offended. Can't believe he said that. What's wrong with that? young? Them young people, they don't know what they're talking about. People have the weirdest ideas, right? They, they just get stuck on the wrong things. Thinking that the world thinks like Americans, that's foolish. It's really small thinking. Or thinking that one group or one color is more important than others. Really wrong thinking. I mean, if you want to look at it, you would kind of think Asian people are God's favorite. He definitely made more of them than anybody else. <laughs> However, in the beginning, God made Adam and Eve. And out of Adam and Eve came all humanity, right? Every color Every people group, every nationality started in the natural, in the physical, from Adam and Eve. Now, the word Adam means red dirt, Adam. The Hebrew word Adam is red dirt. So really, I'm the closest to Adam, <laughs> or one of the closest to Adam. I mean, but really, I mean, I'm just teasing, right? But to think that there are certain groups that are more important, that deserve more attention, that deserve more of the world's whatever, it's wrong thinking. Or to think there's groups that are better. We're somehow higher. We're somehow superior. Tragic. It's foolishness. It's the thinking that happens when you don't know God, when you're not thinking with God, you're thinking from a natural perspective. So we believe all the world, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Then whoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. That we go into the whole world, to every ethnic group, and we preach the gospel and we pray that they will know the Lord. And it's always an individual choice. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons or daughters of God, even to those that believe on his name. Now, there's another, another interesting thought. All humanity is a creation of God. Every human being made in the likeness and image of God. But only those who choose are sons or daughters of God. You don't choose whether you're created or not. You got created. You got born. You're, you're human. Now you choose how you'll live forever, with God or without God, in God's presence or not, as a child of God or not. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God. Sometimes in our world, you know, they try to present this idea. Well, we're all children of God. No, we're all creation of God. Those who choose are children of God. Now look back in Genesis chapter one with me. When, when God created men and women and the physical body was created, he actually started all the races, all the nationalities. It all started right there in Adam and Eve. And it says in verse 26, Genesis 1, 26, let us 
make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over all the earth, fish of the sea, and so forth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. So from this male and this female, all humanity comes forth, all all the nations, all the nationalities, all the languages come forth. Hundreds, thousands of years, it, it manifested. The only delineation that God made was one's a male, one's a female. There was nothing else, male, female. Then we began to grow, multiply, right? He said, Go out there, replenish the earth. So we've been doing that, right, for thousands of years. And as humans grew, some got darker, some got lighter, some developed different languages. Tower of Babel shifted. A lot of languages were developed at that time. But the one thing God said is male and female. Now we've created not only new nations, new language, we've also created new genders. Let's change up the gender thing. But this is thinking beyond what God said. This is thinking that's outside of God's worldview. The whole gender issue, that's not a God thing. That's a human thing. Now, we love those people. We pray for those people. Those are people we want in the kingdom of God. We want them to know the Savior. But the gender identity and the other issues that become racism and divisive and angry, that's not God. Don't put that in your worldview. Don't become a part of that discussion and that spirit because that's outside of what God created. God made you like him. And God made you male or female. And God says, have dominion. Live big. Live large and in charge. Don't get caught up in the weirdness and the craziness of our world. Men created many of these things we see happening in our world today. Men without God become divisive, selfish, carnal. Those who know God honor their creator, their father, and they honor all life. Those who know God honor their father, honor their creator, and they honor all life. It's a funny thing. As you get older, you begin to realize how people shift and how they think about people. Some people really don't see others as very valuable. If they're not the right race or the right culture or the right nationality, they're not as valuable as others. Or if they're not the right age, they're not as valuable. In our world today, if you're a child, an unborn child, and we don't want you, well, you're worthless. We can just get rid of you. We just, just wipe, the, wipe the child out. It's not a deal. Just get rid of the child. But now we're seeing that with older people too, because maybe they have dementia. What good are they? They're just a weight on the family. They're just a cost and an expense. Well, we should be able to just get rid of them. How, how do we get rid of these old people? Well, now I'm an old people. So I'm offended. But people say weird things to me like, are you retired? And I always ask them, what is that? Give me a biblical definition of retirement. Can you show me a scripture that says the retired will be blessed? <laughs> I don't even know what that means to be retired. I, I understand refired, <laughs> rehired. What is retired? You understand my point is, you know, people start looking at you different. When you're young, you're like, oh man, isn't it amazing what God is doing? When you're old, they're like, oh, how old are you? And, and, and I get it. I'm fine. You know, I understand. But as a child of God, as a Christian, our worldview is to value all people. 
We value men and women. We value young and old. We value every nation, every nationality. We view them through God's eyes. Don't buy into the eyes of the world. Don't, don't start seeing life through the ways of the world because you'll get small and you'll get negative and life will be hard when you view it through the eyes of the world. So keep your perspective godly. Keep your worldview godly. You know, one of the things that, that uh, controls us is our identity is so often tied to our work, right? So when people say, oh, what do you do? Well, I'm a salesman. I'm a manager. I'm in real estate. I'm in construction. I'm a nurse. I'm a doc, right? So our, our work defines us. And, and if you let that be your identity, you're kind of on shaky ground because your work can change. You, you could be released from that job. That company can close or that industry can shift. And all of a sudden, who you always said you were is no more. You, you were the, the employee of this group, but it's gone now. You lost your job. So what happens? You have a Life crises and identity crises. Why? Because you identified in the wrong way. The other day I was listening to one of the great athletes in America. I, I won't say the sport. It doesn't really matter. He's a great athlete. He's rich, many millions of dollars. He's number one in the world. He's a champion. You're right. He's done, done it all. So they're interviewing him. Well, how does it feel? You've made X number of millions of dollars. And how does it feel to be number one in the world? How does it feel to be a champion? And he said, oh, I, I really don't know. He said, I, I, I'm a Christian. That's the first thing that I identify with. And the interviewer didn't know what to say. You know, you get some carnal media person, uh, uh, uh couldn't grasp because they think the identity with money, the identity with position, with power, with, with your place, with your championships, they could not understand, well, I identify as a Christian. Now, if in Christ is the priority of your identity, then you will never have a midlife or any life crises. Because that won't change. You can change jobs. You can get older. You can have different struggles and different battles. But you are in Christ. That never changed. The world didn't give it to you and the world can't take it away. So if you've been having those ups and downs, right? If you've been riding those waves of success and failure, stock market is up and down, interest rates up and down, business up and down, had a good job, oh, lost it. Got another job, yay, lost that job. Oh, so I got money in the, oh, I lost all my money, right? If you keep riding those waves, that's when life is just hard. And at the end, you become a grumpy old person because you've just been struggling all these years. But if you could see who you are in Christ, have a godly, biblical worldview. I have a job. That's not who I am. I I'm a pastor, but now I'm almost 70. So they're not going to ask me to preach one of these days. Caleb's going to be like, you know, Dad, we're tired of listening to you. And I got more to say, and so you need to sit down. What am I going to do? Get sad? Have a crisis? Give up? Oh, no. They put me out to pasture. They told me they don't want me. No, they're always going to want me because as long as I have some inheritance that he's hoping for, you know, I'm going to be around. You know what I'm saying? You got to hedge your bet. <laughs> but years go by. 
Circumstance change. Jobs change. Careers change. Influences change. Who you are at 30, you're not that at 70. So it is what it is. But my identity doesn't change. I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have. My identity is in Christ. It's not in a position or, or a paycheck or a company. This world didn't give it to me, and this world can't take it away. Amen? So I'm praying at Christian Faith, we think big. We don't get caught in the prejudices and the fights and the devices, divisiveness of the world, but we live with a godly world view. Would you close your eyes with me?